Windows user. It's time to get Sissy Hypnode into the world of Linux. Look at this stallman. Look at that, that comfy boat with this comfy computer. He's using Linux. So, anyway, you're on Windows, so you're going to want to install Windows Subsystem for Linux 2, or WSL. You copy this little command into your command prompt. You paste it in. And then I'm, I'm going to cancel out here because I I've already have it. But, yeah, it basically installs a copy of Ubuntu. And Ubuntu is also... It's like Windows, it's kind of crappy. Goes to restart, and then you're going to want to install Windows Terminal. That's, you're, you're just going to need it. So you launch your, um, your terminal. And from there, you've actually got a few different choices. Like, it's going to have PowerShell, it's going to have Command Prompt. We're going to do Ubuntu. And my first suggestion well, this this whole thing boots up is that you go right over here to bash crawl this uh, GitLab page for it you go and you bring up your um, your file Explorer you go over right to this little Linux thing here you go over to this, uh, this Ubuntu thing and find your home folder now on Linux you're only gonna want to put stuff in your home directory it's not like uh, Windows where you just throw random stuff on your root of your C or just random places so you're always gonna go in your home directory and then your username from there got ourselves a bash crawl I went ahead and unzipped it and we've got this directory here inside that directory we have the entrance folder I go back one and we're going to launch this terminal, type in CD, do a little space, and we'll drag this entrance thing over here, has the um, location, hit enter, and then after that, well, you know what, no, that is not what we're going to do, that, clear, that didn't happen, so anyway, I'm just going to LS here, and we're just going to CD, Type in a B for bash crawl. Just hit tab. It's going to auto-complete. Forget that whole last part. That didn't happen. And then, uh, what is it? So I have LS here. What do I got? Entrance. Okay, I'll type in an E. Do the, uh, the tab thing. It freezes because it doesn't like auto-completing that much. Okay. Well, screw you too. There we go. And I'm just going to clear here. And let's see what we got in the entrance here. So, in the instructions on the uh, the GitLab page, scroll down here. It's going to want us to use um, cat to... Um, let me actually scroll up right here. Where has it? Okay. So, CD into it. And then we're just going to cat on that scroll to read the file. Tab to complete, enter, and it gives us this nice little thing. It is pitch black in these catacombs. You have a magical spell, and they spell with a K in there, so you know it's it's super magical. That lists all the items in a room. Type LS. That command you've you've seen me use a billion times. Just uh, yeah. There we go. LS. So we got seller and scroll. To move around, type CD other command I've been using this whole time so seller tab and then clear this so I can get to the top we'll ls this here and then let's cat this next scroll let's give us um, illusions are strong here it is difficult to tell what is a doorway and what is an object and so it gives you this whole thing where it has you like alias um, ls um, space hyphen capital F um, the capital is important this is uh, case sensitive uh, but yeah it's a nice little game you can go through it on here and 
should teach you a little bit of uh, the command line, which isn't everything about Linux, but it's a little bit important. And then also, um, let me bring up that terminal again, because it's actually going to give you uh, full access to the apt package, package manager within, um, and you can set this to your default for Ubuntu. Um, but yeah, you have all the uh, normal apt or apt commands, uh, whichever way you want to pronounce it. And it lets you um, install packages. And you can even have like uh, like graphical tools within it too. So you can just do like um, sudo or sudo, either way we pronounce it. Apt and then clean. And you type in your, uh, your password here. There we go. Secret password. And then it's all us here. So we're gonna CD into this panel directory where I have panel attack from that one video. And then if I go into here, I already have love 2D installed. So I just type in love and then I've already renamed uh, this panel thing here. And give it a good second. It should launch a, um, a graphical X environment from um, this virtual machine. Okay, there we go. It has a little auto updater. I'm gonna close out of that part. And then it has the actual game. So if there's anything graphically you need to run within Linux, uh, you can just do it through um, WSL2, which is, um, I, I think it's easier launching things and doing stuff from uh, Windows subsystem for Linux uh, 2. Gotta add that too, even though it gets taken off sometimes. Uh, it's a lot easier than just, you know, switch back to a virtual machine, have it a virtual desktop, have it slow down. It's just, nah, I, I just launched it straight from Windows. Um, and then we got ourselves uh, Ubuntu, the, uh, the Ubuntu manga, which is uh, pretty good, or manga, if you want to be pedantic. If you're one of those guys that's like, it's karaoke? No, it's karaoke. Like, get out of here, bro. Get out of here. You're not fooling anyone. No one wants to switch accents like that, like mid sentence. So, manga. And it's pretty good. He's, this girl over here is like, I only like the command line. This dude over here is like, I only like hentai games. And this other girl over here is like, I like Max. And then she really likes Ubuntu, and then they all, they all uh, get into Ubuntu, um, wacky anime stuff. It's pretty fun. I'll link it. Um, then also, gonna want to maybe get um, Unix and Linux System Administration Handbook uh, Fifth Edition. It's, uh, it's it's really handy. It's like 1,200 pages of just really useful stuff it's like a few years old now um, I'd recommend buying a copy even though you can probably find one online like super easy by just googling the name and then putting in PDF in the end of it like everyone does but I've, having like a physical thing to thumb through it's it's great um, and I think this is like the last one that um, was that Evie Nemeth um, that she had some part in um, She's now like lost at sea. There's like a whole story with that, but um, it's really sad. But really, really um, good book. You can tell the dedication behind it. And if you just ignore a couple things, uh, with you know the way that uh, the whole Red Hat things changed over the last year, it, it really hasn't changed that much, honestly. Like, it's still the the gold standard, but you know, and their their models changed a little bit. But other than that. You know, rock solid. Goes from uh, everything you ever wanted to know about System D to alternatives. It always brings up an alternative, and it's um, really solid. Um, then also, if you want motivation to do more Linuxy things, you got this uh, Unix porn um, Reddit. It's probably the only time I'm gonna recommend like Reddit, but um. Yeah, these guys are having a lot of fun. Um, I don't care much for all this Wayland stuff, but yeah, I don't know. 
I don't know, it's fine. It's Waylon, it's fine. It's future, I guess. I guess. Uh, we'll get to that. So anyway, Linux in a nutshell, it's a kernel and then it's user land. So the kernel we have um, originally started by Linus Torvalds. Uh, it's sort of like a, a brief overview. And he's got sort of like the back end kernel part. Um, not really much of the user land part. And then we have GNU and the Free Software Foundation with people like Richard Stallman who were already working on some of their other tools like the uh, GNU Core Utils, the um, GNU uh, C compiler, just other projects that would eventually make it into this whole like Linuxy thing. You know, I mean, there's other other people in other places like, you know, the whole like X11 project and all that stuff that's been going on since forever. That's also kind of wound up being around the uh, the BSD and, and Linux space. But yeah, this is uh, so GNU herd was what GNU was going to use before. And it was like a micro kernel. But then monolithic kernels kind of like went out and it was like. Oh god, I guess we gotta use Linux now. And you know, they've they've had their stuff on Linux ever since. Uh here's Richard Stallman being a petty douche. Um being like, oh yeah, Linux, it fits into this giant GNU part, and then the tiny Linux kernel. Linux kernel, one of the, the biggest projects uh known to man software wise. Oh yeah, yeah, totally totally smaller than this whole GNU part. People have kind of made fun of this because uh, System D is around and it's kind of taken over a lot of stuff as an init system that it normally wouldn't. And it's like, yeah, GNU and Linux. Plus plugging into this uh, GNU and Linux are just a small part of the overall System D operating system. <laughs> it might as well be. It's, it's, it's kind of crazy. But um, yeah, it's like a bunch of puzzle pieces put together is what Linux is, you know, you get the, the kernel, you got the user land parts, you got all these little pieces put together. They're all interchangeable for the most part, which is great. And a lot of it is kind of like this, you got your peanut butter and my chocolate, I got my chocolate and your peanut butter kind of situation where you're just like, huh, I guess, I guess this works. And that, that happened just a bunch of times and then we got cool stuff. So yeah, we got, um, just gonna go over desktop environments first, because that's gonna be one of the more important things. Then we'll go over distros and other little pieces and parts, um, until we get to a demonstration. So, you've got GNOME, which ships with, uh, Ubuntu and Pop! OS. It's, it's okay, it uses a lot of RAM for Linux desktop, um, I would recommend using dash to panel as an add-on with it if you have to. You know, it makes it more Windowsy, which is nice. Um, yeah, there's Pop OS, uh, which is okay. It works for what it is. Um, and then we got uh, KDE, which is um, their Plasma desktop environment. is It's pretty big, honestly. Like a lot of people have used it. Um, I I think it's okay. Another one, um, got Cinnamon desktop environment, which is actually done directly by the, um, like the Linux Mint guys, which is kind of cool. Very hands-on when it comes to, um, the Cinnamon desktop environment, like, the only thing I don't like is that you really can't, like, like, the, the compositor's kind of, like, stuck there, so you were I, I wound up in, like, some situations with screen tearing, um, I'm sure there's ways to resolve it. I was using X, and everyone's going like, oh, man, you gotta use, you know, I, I don't even know if they have a Wayland version of Cinnamon. I'm pretty sure they do at this point, but, um, yeah. So some screen tearing issues because I, I couldn't switch compositors. Could have been user error, but it's one of those uh, rabbit hole things you wind up with Linux. Um, there's also uh, XFCE. I think I had trouble turning out the cursor blinking with this one. It's like a pet peeve of mine, but I, it's it's decent. Um, 
I would add in a different file manager. I'm not a big fan of Thanar, which comes with it. Um, yeah, you know, I'd get like Dolphin or some decent file manager. Um, but yeah, it's it's not too bad. Uh, then Mate, which is my preferred desktop environment, but only the Linux Mint version of it. Like Mate out of the box is like eh. It's, it's it's not it's not anything to write home about it's old and but if you add some stuff onto it like you throw in like mate menu you throw on some themes which kind of brings me to another problem later in the video but man I, I it makes it to where I'm like okay I gotta be on mint they got all the the cool mate plugins they got all the the themes um what I do copy all their dot files and install mate menu and all their plugins like manually that's i don't know but we'll figure that out but anyway there's i3 so we're moving on to window managers these were desktop environments they come with file managers um browsers everything out of the box in these desktop environments are kind of all in ones um i3 is kind of like that too it comes with everything out of the box with most distros um, that comes with and it's it's a really good intro into uh, tiling window managers if you're really into never using the mouse like there's people that, that really don't want to use the mouse um, sway is basically i3 if you're using Wayland uh, which again it, it works about the same as like i3 so it's not a big deal so yeah um, we'll get over to x11 and Wayland pretty soon because those are going to be eh, kind of important then we got a uh, awesome window manager uses some easy like Lua configs and yeah a lot of people seem to like it you can always find like a YouTube video going over someone's like config and then you know they'll link their dot files for configuration you can just copy over and yeah it's not bad uh, and then there's DWM um, this one's gonna be like it's a little bit more of a time sink because it's suckless and they like to have minimalist software and minimalist software is um, you know it's, it's gonna take your time but in a good way I mean you'll have fun with it but I don't know it's it's if you really like tiling window managers and minimalist software then DWM if you want some some super high response time um, and then we've got open box which is it's kind of like a mix like you can kind of just uh, mix and match little parts that has a lot of customization to it so it's kind of in between like desktop environments and window managers it's like a floating window manager so uh, not not a bad uh, deal right there but Anyway, so if we want to go through, um, say, like the the Mate desktop environment, just uh, the base one, you can actually see all the different things that are bundled in it um, on their wiki. So they've got the uh, the Atril PDF viewer, they've got the Kaja uh, file manager or Kaya. I, I don't know how to pronounce there, but it's it's been pretty decent. Like it's not a bad file manager. You can launch the terminal from it. Um, has like a search built in, which is is nice. You know, it's better than Thanar. And yeah, you can just go piece by piece and see exactly everything they've added to it. Like they've added their their calculator to it. They've got the Mate terminal, which if you're not picky about terminals, which I'm not, um, terminal emulators, um, that one's perfectly fine. And then uh, just some examples, so. We've got a uh, KDE's Dolphin, which you can install on any system. So, say you have like a desktop environment, it's Mate. And if you really want Dolphin as your file manager, you can just just install it. Like it's pretty modular. Um, and same for um, GNU's, um, not GNU's. I'm uh, sorry, Gnome's Nautilus, which you could pronounce that GNOME or GNOME. Uh, it's not associated with the GNU project at all, um, but I think it's just like by habit you see a G in Linux land and you're like hmm I'm gonna pronounce that so 
Yeah, Nautilus is, is pretty good. Like Dolphin better. And then Nemo. I got no problems with Nemo either. Um, now, if you want to go all out like minimalist, you can always do um, LF and just have like a like a terminal um, file manager, which is kind of nice. It's like a it's like a TUI, not a GUI, like a graphical user has interface. Like a what is it? TUI. It's like a it's like a text user interface. I want to say I may be wrong about that, but HTOP has like a similar thing. Um, so yeah, um, every part of Linux can be sort of like swapped out. So here we have like the GNU core utils, which go into a lot of your main utilities like MKDIR for make directory. That's a part of the core utilities. Um, just like really basic things like MV to move files, RM to remove files. Um, let's see. Um, Chmod for um, changing, like if you want to change permissions on like a file or something like that. Um, just really important uh, utilities. And we've got BusyBox here, which is sort of like the, it. you could actually just replace the GNU core utils with BusyBox. So it's kind of like one or the other, or you could have both if you wanted to. But it's just kind of like that whole, like everything has a backup. If there's an application people depend on, there's going to be another application that does a similar thing. Like right here, uh, if we scroll up, scroll down, I think. Oh, yeah, yeah. Make directory. They've got it here, too. So yeah, if we go over, um, this is another one. So this is just kind of like a placeholder, but we've got four. Um, Display servers, we have Xorg or X11 or just X, just whatever you want to call it, um, which has just been around for a while. It's pretty solid. Uh, it's getting a little long in the tooth. Um, as far as development, it's a little stagnant, which is why we have uh, the Wayland develop uh, the Wayland uh, display server. But Wayland acts a little bit different, like it puts a little bit more on the compositor, and so you have stuff like WL roots that um, it's kind of like libraries to help um, development with that. Uh, it's a little bit different, so but I mean at this point I, I mostly just use X. Um, probably gonna have to use Wayland at some point. I know on my Pine phone I wound up having to use Wayland just because it's a little bit like quicker with certain things and doesn't have as much screen tearing but yeah um, then we also have the confusingly named display manager so these are display servers they're over there like drawing the windows um, keeping that in order um, and then display managers are more like a login manager and it's more of like an X thing um, the, the you know you have it on like Wayland 2 in a different way but here you're mostly just gonna see like GDM or light DM just about like these two right here and the, the cool thing is is if you have multiple by the way I don't think I mentioned you could have multiple um, desktop environments or window managers installed at the same time and then when you log in and out through either you know like light DM or GDM or whatever your uh, display manager is uh, you can actually choose to switch between those environments like the only problem with desktop environments is you'll have like a lot of the same, like you'll have like two different like file explorers or something like that, or file managers, whatever you want to call them. Um, but yeah, just uh, make sure that the, the material is not too confusing um, because they, they kind of overlap with these names. But yeah, you have something uh, prominent like system D, which is the init system. So it starts as like your first process on the computer and it stays with it until you actually like shut down and so it's just there to initialize things um, but system D has kind of taken over a little bit like there's a lot of extra services it offers whereas you have uh, more stripped down in its systems like OpenRC but most systems by default will just be like systemd because it's such like a 
core part of your system and people use a lot of parts of it like um, for instance you can replace cron with system d which is just crazy like you can just use system d timers and they're actually more accurate than cron too like you can go to like the second i want to say either like the second or the minute and um it's kind of impressive and there's a lot of things like that like you can you know control shutdown you can do a lot of extra things with uh, system d um but because of that it's kind of encroached as a init system and then we got another example of uh double duty here so we've got sudo or um sudo uh whichever we want to pronounce it um and this is like your privilege manager so if you're typing a command and you need it to um have elevated access then you're typing sudo before it now you could also install do as which is from uh, OpenBSD and has like a Linux port and this will do just about the same thing with um, some features lost but I mean it's not anything I would use um, so you could technically use either or most distros will just ship like sudo like as is I mean if you want to tinker you can always like add do as but not really much of a reason but it is good to have a backup though and then we've got another um, kind of double duty thing so we have the GNU C compiler or um, I guess it's a GNU compiler collection okay I didn't realize it was that too with the GCC may have um, I'm not went wrong but anyway so we have this um, from GNU and you can use it to like build different things um, if you're making things from source and we've also got Clang which is like a front end for uh, LLVM which is like a cross compiler thing which is also you could also compile stuff with sometimes you'll run into projects where you'll need like both GCC and Clang um, it's not too often and it's really not too often that you're gonna have to compile many things from source unless you're just kind of having fun um, like for instance if you wanted to um, aspirate um, you could actually compile this one from source um, which is kind of crazy like they put it up here you can buy the binaries or you can actually go through their instructions and just make it for free like they just um, offer the binaries at like a convenience fee and oh, it's kind of a cool system um, I guess there's uh, glibc and um, muse. I have to pronounce this so m u s l libc. Um, but I don't know. That's really not something you ever have to worry about for the most part. But again, just another thing. It's good that there's like a alternative there. Like everything has a backup. So let's see. Yeah, another thing you may have to worry about is um, dependencies. So a lot of applications are either going to be in something GTK, so you'll have like GTK2, GTK3, GTK4, and so on. Um, same with like QT, you'll have like QT3, QT4, QT5 um, applications, and you may or may not have that dependency for a specific application. Um, and if it's like older, you may have to re-download an older version of Qt for it. Um, and but flat packs and stuff, they, they take care of a lot of this and we'll, we'll get to those, but they're really handy for dealing with the like GUI framework dependencies. Then we got Electron. Um, well, Electron apps are gross anyway, like Microsoft Teams and yeah, and Discord. Discord? I don't know. But uh, still gonna use that crap anyway. But yeah, that one you don't have to worry about dependencies as much with uh, Electron. And then um, it's gonna go over the different packaging formats. So first of all, you're gonna wanna get stuff from your, um, your distribution's main repositories first, your main repos, which are maintained by package containers. It's maintainers package maintainers that's, that's totally what they're called 
and they um go through and they like package different stuff up with the binaries for that distro and it's it's really going to be your ideal light to, to get things um unless they have like older packages for software that you want um and then we've got app images and app images are actually really handy they're sort of like um linux's equivalent to uh, portable executables so you just like double click on it and it just automatically launches or sometimes you have to like right click on it and do like a whole like allow executable thing and then it does it but yeah overall really handy um like for instance if you're getting like retroarch on linux definitely want to get the uh the app image um it's going to be more up to date than other versions of it or you can get the flat pack directly from them i would not recommend getting retroarch directly from your distributions repos even though you can for a lot of uh, distributions just because you're going to want to be most up to date but i don't know app image is great flat pack is great too the only thing about flat packs so a flat pack um takes care of all the dependencies for you and it downloads its own versions of those dependencies so it's sometimes like doubling up and you've got applications that are probably like three to four times bigger than they they really need to be but you know because they're bigger because they're handling that dependency for you you don't actually have to um, do as much yourself and a lot of developers will just tell people, hey, just, just use the Flatpak version. I don't support any other version. And so, yeah, kind of like Brave New World stuff, but I don't know. I like it if I have enough space. And then there's um, the Deb format if you're on, like, uh, Debian-based. So a Debian-based distro would be, like, a Ubuntu or Debian or Linux Mint. And technically, um run these anywhere else with uh, DP, uh, DPKG and then you can run that and then technically install a deb on like a non-debian system but I don't know it's, it's not really needed then we got RPMs which is um, for Red Hat stuff and it's really if you're using Fedora you can use RPMs uh, no one else uses them so then we got snaps, the uh, the red-headed stepchild of packages. They're kind of like flat packs, if flat packs were terrible. Um, so all of your stuff's hosted on uh, can canonical servers, uh, the Ubuntu guys, and they approve stuff. They don't approve stuff. Your applications here automatically update. Some applications installed through Snap run a little bit slower starting up I don't know it's just not worth it like every Ubuntu based distro sort of like rips this out like pop OS rips it out mint rips it out no one wants snaps there's like one dude out there that wants snaps that's it and so also gonna get into user rep repositories which is like a thing with um, Fedora so Fedora has uh, RPM Fusion, you can enable it, and then you can just use their normal package manager to get packages from it. Um, and then Arch Linux has sort of like a similar thing with the uh, Arch user repository, the AUR, which is what they're kind of like known for. And to get those, you're gonna wanna get like an AUR helper. Um, the last one I used when I was using um, Arch was um, was Padu. Uh, where is it on this list here? Oh yeah, Padu right there. P A R U. Pretty solid. And yeah, you can just go on here. It's it's user packages, so kind of use at your own risk. But they are generally like tested sometimes and flagged. Um, but yeah, just completely uh, community driven. And that's actually going to get into. Um, the distros here and their package manager so we've got Debian which is granddaddy of a lot of distros so you get Debian and then Ubuntu is based on Debian and then 
Linux Mint is based on Ubuntu. Um, so it's, it's kind of like this whole like human centipede kind of thing. And then of course we have, um, I forget how you pronounce this, Devuan, I don't know, it was, didn't look right, D-E-V-U-A-N. It's, it's Debian without, um, without system D. So if you want to use another init system that's not system D, uh, you're going to have to use them. And um, all of these um, distros use apt or apt uh, as their package manager. So if you ever see that around, just know it's one of these distros. And then we've got Arch. Um, and Arch is a, a mainline distro. It is a mainline distro, so that's like a kind of like a plus from it. Got really good documentation, and it's it's overall just really solid. And then we've got Artix which is Arch Linux without systemd so you can use like um, you know like OpenRC or something like that um, it's just really solid and they both use the um, the Pac-Man um, at least I think I do I you know I actually haven't checked with Artix uh, I'm just assuming they use Pac-Man might use something different but um yeah they just use Pac-Man for their package manager at least Arch does um, then we got Manjaro. Just don't use Manjaro. Um, I've had issues with it. There's just like little quirks. Like they've got their own package manager here, Pamac. But they're also like, hey, go ahead and enable like Arch's like user repositories, because they're like an Arch-based distro. But they they're just goofy, honestly. Just get an Arch installer and install mainline Arch Linux. There's no real reason to mess around with Manjaro. Don't don't think of them as like an installer, like distro. They, I don't know. It doesn't add enough for me to justify them being around. And then um, got Red Hat Enterprise Linux, which is you're not going to be running, but you might run. Where's Fedora? Okay, there it is. Yeah, Fedora, which is based off of uh, Red Hat Enterprise Linux. Um, so you've got that kind of stability there. A lot of stuff that's going to be um, tested on the, the Red Hat systems. Uh, gets over to Fedora first. They've got good user repositories. And uh, they've got the, the DNF package manager. So that's what they're using. And let's see. Oh, yeah. Gen 2. So every other distro on here is going to be a binary based distro. This one is a source based distro, meaning you make all of your software from source. So you've got to compile everything and that takes a long time. So, you know, make sure you got like a thread ripper or something that's going to compile stuff fast because that's that takes forever. And then uh, from there, we've got our our our. 4chan distro that died which is based off of uh, Gen 2 so it's like an optimized Gen 2 Clover OS um, it's it's just not around anymore because it just didn't need to exist um, then we've got Nix OS weird thing about them is they actually have um, so they've got the Nix package manager and you can technically run that on any distro um, just a lot of benefits for that one, like rollbacks and stuff. But yeah, if you're if you're ready to learn a lot, then go ahead and just learn Nix. It takes a minute, but a lot of people seem to like it. And then there's uh, there's Alpine Linux. So all these other uh, distributions, aside from Gen2, Gen2 you can actually use any. Um, and it's system and any set of like core utils that you want. Uh, it's like complete freedom with Gen 2 because you're doing everything with, um, you're making everything from source with Portage. But Alpine over here, they're over here using BusyBox instead of the GNU core utils. And it's just like a size thing. And, um, you know, stuff like Docker uses like Alpine on the back end. It's like really like lightweight is what they aim, they're aiming for and 
And it's it's pretty solid from what I've used it. And the, and the only time I've really used it, oh yeah, and their their package manager is APK. But the only time I've I've really used it is with the uh, like the Pine Phone. So Post Market OS, which is a great project by the way, they're they're really like sticking with the whole Pine Phone thing. You know, they've got um, a few different, um, pretty interesting uh, distributions they're supporting there, too. Like, um, SXMO, which actually, ironically, it's simple X mobile, but they use Wayland now. But anyway, they use um, Alpine, and so I've kind of gotten used to, you know, just doing things a little bit differently. But, um... Oh, it's an interesting. I I, I like Alpine. Um, don't have much of a use case for them, but on mobile it's nice. Um, anyway, yeah, we got OpenSUSE, which I don't know. I haven't I haven't messed with them much. I I just know they exist. So it's, it's a mainline distro, so it's nice. And they've got Zipper. That's their package manager. And then we got Puppy Linux, which isn't really a distro. It's more like a set of different distros kind of optimized for lower end hardware. And so if you got like an old laptop or something, then Puppy Linux is probably your best bet. Then we got Slackware. I, I don't think I've ever known anyone to use Slackware. Uh, it's one of the first Linux distros, which is cool first Linux distros that's still like in active development but um yeah I, I don't know anyone that uses it and then got the terminals so people get picky about these but I again I just take whatever terminal is with in the desktop environment I have I'm just I'll just take it you know I'll take the uh, the mate terminal I'll take console with a K for KDE. I'll take that. That one's serviceable. If you want to be fancy though, you gotta get like Alacrity, which is like um, GPU accelerated. Works super quick and I don't know. Alacrity is pretty slick, but um, just don't, don't really have a use case. Then we got the uh, ST suckless terminal. Like the thing with Suckless is even their names are minimalist. It's just two letters, ST. And um, yeah, you can make stuff go pretty fast with that one. It's the cool thing. But um, again, learning curve, you gotta recompile stuff. It's, it, you know, it is what it is. And then you got, um, inside of these terminal emulators, you're gonna wanna run a shell. And with most, uh, most people just use DSH now because it's kind of like a standard like even uh, Mac OS switched over to ZSH stands for Z shell then we get bash stands for born again shell bash is also pretty big for the most part it doesn't really matter unless you're using things that are specific to ZSH or you know stuff that's like kind of like a bashism Kind of specific to bash, then you're usually fine. Then there's fish, and they're just like, well, we really don't care about port being portable. Just, just have, just use us. Have fun. Fish is, fish is interesting. They got fishisms, and um, of course, if you want to use any of these and use just um, and just try to write as portable, POSIX compliant. Uh, shell script without any kind of like you know bashisms or zshisms or fishisms you can always run your um your scripts through shell check and it's pretty handy like if you want to just have like if you want to be like that guy you're like i want this to run anywhere that's pretty good and so then we got our file systems that you can choose from just going to go over a couple we got extend4, ext4, I just, just say extend4, um, which again, you're going to find out a lot of distros. It's more for just daily use kind of thing. 
Same with the uh, BTRFS, uh, which is is going pretty um, pretty well lately. Honestly, like a lot of people use it for both like day to day use, uh, kind of re kind of like replacing Extend Four, but also if they're um, using like a backup system, like I think the Synology boxes use BTRFS by default, which is kind of cool. Because then you have like actual like backup formats like uh, ZFS, the Zettabyte file system. What does BTRFS stand for? Oh, better FS, better FS, Btrf. Okay, no, not gonna not gonna care about BTRFSs, but ZFSs though. The Zettabyte file system sounds cool as cool as fuck. They got Sun Microsystems. Now Oracle, unfortunately, um, sucking the soul out of every tech company. Thank you, Oracle, for being terrible. But yeah, they got um, ZFS is like sort of like your backup system. So, it, sorry, your back your backup file system. Like um, it has like snapshots and stuff like you'd find in like BTRFS, but it takes you a little bit further. Not too sure on the technical stuff. I just know. If I'm running a NAS, it's going to have ZFS on it. Uh, NAS is a network attack storage, in, in case you ever need to know that. Um, and then we have NTFS, which is, is Microsoft's um, crappy file system. You can use it on, on Linux if you want to, if you hate yourself. Or just, just don't. But you can. Then we got, um, again, if you're ever going to look up anything in Linux, you just type in man before the command. So you can just be like, man, man. And it'll give you information on the manual. Um, if you need other kind of help, you can also use um, TLDR pages, which you can install and use a lot like man. And just kind of use it to, um, if you're in the terminal, you need like some examples, just type in... Uh, TLDR and then the name of the program and it just shoots all that out for you then we got cheat.sh um, this one you can actually go online and check on which is kind of cool like ffmpeg go to that page um, then they actually have like a lot of ffmpeg examples here like let's see print file metadata convert P3, that kind of thing. And then for the core utils, you type in the word help before them. If you want more info, like if you want more info on like cat, you type in help, etc. So that kind of thing. You go ahead and There we go. Most importantly, RTFN. RTFM. That's is, is pronouncing it right. Um, read the friendly manual. That's what you gotta do. So anyway, uh, just gonna go over like a quick overview of um, kind of like experience some um, those crappy um, Chromebooks. I, I love them. I love repurposing them, but sometimes it gets a gets a little bit much. So, here we've got me installing an older version of Linux Mint, one of the 20 series. It'll take a good second to go through with that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Wait. Um, before we go to that, got it set to Catalinaville. Always got it set to Catalinaville. Go through this here. install but yeah goes through and got the uh, the update manager here la launched um but you can do the update manager and meant sort of like you would um sudo apt um update or sudo apt update and in apt upgrade uh to kind of go through all of that um do run in some uh, roadblocks here but 
Oh, it's a pretty solid uh, desktop environment. Go through here. Doing the actual upgrade. If you ever need to upgrade through their um, package manager here. Um, not their package manager, but their update uh, manager. You just go to this, um, this edit tab up here. Uh, where is it? Edit and then upgrade to and then it gives you like the the version right there and we have me changing the display a little bit because yeah Linux doesn't do very well with fractional scaling so I, it's just set to 200 so it's just doubled um, I always go through and I turn off the Bluetooth completely um, and with these Chromebooks too I also make sure because they have like an internal speaker uh, to go through like the sound preferences and always disable the um, the internal speaker just so that didn't cause an issue and then let me go through preferences do the little neo fetch thing here too so you can get the uh, a cool little logo and some info then we're gonna go through Firefox and Brave actually has like a full like install thing for um, like you're not going to want to install this through your package manager like you normally would or through your um, software store or whatever you have. Um, you're just going to want to follow their commands, add their repo, uh, their repo and then just update from there. Let's see. Oh my god, four hours. Yeah, I spent a little bit too much time on this tonight. Have not slept. Um, yeah, we got Brave going. The restart for that. I pin it over to the task on here. Pinned it. Entered in the password. Then I was like, oh yeah, I'll go install TIC80. Just a fun little like, fancy computer thing. Then I was like, you know what? Uh, for funsies, I'm gonna go try to make it from source. And then I used the wrong instructions there. Then I used the right instructions. And then did not compile. I was like, you know what? I'm gonna go over there to uh, ask the sprite and um, try to compile that part. Could not compile that program either. I've ran into some issues, so. Let's see. I was like, you know what? I can't compile either of these. Let me try using the mint up <laughs> the, the the mint um upgrade tool. Spelled it wrong because I was, was kind of tired at this point. Installed it. And then I ran uh, mint upgrade as a super user with sudo. Then I took off the uh, time shift part because I did this on one of those like 16 gigabyte, like um, two gigabytes of RAM, like Chromebooks. I was like, yeah, Linux Mint 21. And then ran out of some space there. Um, kept on updating <laughs> and updating and updating. And updating, get updating, and it was like, oh man, you're out of space, bro. Okay, so I'll restart. That's what I'll do. And then it was just like, nah, bro, you're gonna reinstall this. And I was like, okay, hold on, let me let me power off and restart again. I'll launch it again. Then it was like, nope. That stops at 420. So, yeah. Linux can uh, be fun. It can be not fun. It can be a lot of things. So, whatever you're going to make it.